So welcome everyone. Here comes Julia, let's get her in. Um, welcome everyone to the China US Women's Foundation Zoom session. Um, we're happy to have you all with us today. Um, the Women's Foundation started about three years ago to be a platform for women in China and the US to share ideas best practices and to support each other to help us to thrive. Um, so many things have happened in the last year, but that has redoubled our efforts to communicate and support each other. Of course, uh, with the event of Biden's taking the presidency, we are expecting that relations between China and the US will um, actually get closer. And so we are looking forward to more interaction with uh, women in China. Um, with us today, we have Michelle Dickinson, um, who's going to talk to us about mental health, something that's going to um, really be an issue for the world. Um, uh, in 2021. Um, I just wanted to give a little update about what's happening in China. Um, at the height of China's outbreak, more than a third of people around the country experienced symptoms of depression, anxiety, insomnia, or acute stress. Um, an expert in Beijing recently warned that the effects could linger for 10 or 20 years. Because of the Chinese government's top-down leadership, officials have mobilized quickly to provide health help. Local governments have set up hotlines, psychological associations have rolled out apps and held online seminars. Schools are screening students for insomnia and depression and universities are establishing new counseling centers. But the country also faces serious challenges. There's a dearth of therapists for the country's 1.4 billion people and fewer than nine mental health professionals for every 100,000 residents as of 2017. Um, the problem um, is bad in America and Michelle's going to talk to us today, um, but there is more awareness about um, uh, mental health issues um, in America. So in that way, we are a little bit further along. Um, the Women's Foundation is going to focus on mental health issues, both in China and the US in 2021. And we invite all of you, um, if you have expertise, thoughts on the matter, to be in touch with us. Um, we are a um, active community who uh, welcomes your interaction. Um, so with that, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Michelle Dickinson. She's a passionate mental health advocate, a TED uh, Talk speaker, and a published author of a memoir entitled Breaking Into My Life. After years of playing the role of caregiver, Michelle embarked on her own healing journey of self-discovery. So we're going to hear about compassion, open conversations, and mental health awareness, and how um, this can bring positive change. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you all for having me. Um, yeah, let's have a conversation about that. So I have some slides I'd love to share with you. Okay. Um, this isn't gonna be all the talking head kind of thing. We're gonna have a conversation. So um, I think the first thing we need to get grounded in is that we definitely are experiencing a, um, a second pandemic and that's around mental health. And the CDC reported that um, one in three Americans are suffering from either anxiety or depression. But actually, in fact, I recently uh, interviewed uh, Paul Gian Gianfrido, who is the president of Mental Health America. He said, we are inching toward one in two. So we really do have a problem um, and we really do need to give this more attention um, you know, for all of our populations. So I think it's important for you to understand why I care, right? Why is, why is this girl, Michelle here talking to me about mental health? Why do I care? So I wanna first set the stage for you as to why that statistic is so scary for me. Mental health has been a part of my life for, for as long as I can remember. My mother uh, had bipolar disorder and I grew up caring for her and loving her and understanding what mental illness looked like from that perspective. And I equate it to being on a roller coaster with her manic highs 
and a deep depressing lows. Um, and it shaped me, it shaped me into the woman that I became today. But then fast forward and I've been able to navigate my career quite well. I um, thought I was, I was, you know, the anomaly. I was able to actually take that situation, turn it on its head and have a very, have a very um, fulfilling um, and successful career in the pharmaceutical industry. And I never really ever talked about my mother's mental illness. I was uh, adopted. So I thought I was pretty much going to be immune to it. But then I was nominated to give my talk to tell my story about mental health because where I was working, we were committed to creating a stigma-free environment, an environment where everybody could be themselves, everyone could bring their whole selves to work. So I sort of went first, stepped on the TEDx stage, gave my talk, and that gave me the confidence to um, write my memoir, which is Breaking Into My Life. And it's really the um, raw version of what life is like caring for someone with a mental illness. Um, <clears throat> but then shortly after that, I was diagnosed with depression myself. I was going through um, the divorce of a very long marriage. I was struggling and I sought help because I was something I was very comfortable with and I got support. And as an adopted daughter, you know, I thought I would be okay. I thought I would never deal with this, but in reality, it just reminded me that nobody's immune to a mental illness um, and a life event can come along and take you down at any time. Uh, so that was a reality for me. But then as I'm working in my, in my company, I'm asked to lead the first mental health employee resource group. And so we were creating a culture of compassion. We were executing initiatives that were creating more open dialogue. We were highlighting resources that were available. And um, I was using my story to do that only to have my boss tell me that uh, I didn't meet expectations because I didn't bring my bubbly upbeat self to work every day. And in that moment, a fire was lit within me. And it made me think to myself, how many other employees, how many other people finally find the courage within themselves to speak up only to be met with that level of uh, no compassion. So fast forward from there and I create my company called Trifecta Mental Health. And that company um, is my baby and it is something that I created to be the change I wanted to see in the world. So what I do is I work with companies to create cultures of compassion, leaning into my experience working with my Fortune 50 company. Um, so that brings me to um, telling you a little bit about how I work with organizations. And then I wanna share with you some things that you can take away from this conversation today and hopefully apply. Um, when the pandemic hit last year, a client had said to me, I'm very worried about my people. They're home, they're isolated, they're working remotely and um, worried about their well-being. And from that, my Pure Resilience program was born. And that program um, is really designed to empower people to create structures and routines in their life that help them stay in a in a um, mentally grounded space. Um, so one of the things I wanted to share with you today is one of my empowering tips from that program, just to give you a sense and also leave you with something. Um, so did you know the first 17 seconds of your day are incredibly important? <laughs> I don't know if you would know this, but it's very important what we do in that morning few moments when we open our eyes. When you sleep, your momentum of thought actually stops. And you have an opportunity in the first 17 seconds to actually start your day off on the right foot. So before uh, you lay there and you think of all the things that you um, are stressed about or have to do, uh, try for in that moment to think about good feeling thoughts. And this is where I invite you to even think about three things that you're grateful for because that helps set momentum in the positive direction. Uh, one of the ways that I do this is I have a, an app called the five minute journal. 
and the five minute journal has you answer, what are your th three things you're grateful for? Upload a favorite picture that you have and set an intention for your day. That exercise can literally shift the trajectory for how your day goes. The next thing I wanna share with you is a little bit about what we can all do, how we can all make a difference. And even working remotely, we have like this virtual culture that still exists wherever we're working. So I wanna share with you how we can all cultivate more empathy and compassion for one another. And it, these are simple things to do, but they're very important things to do. And I think if we take these on, we can actually influence our environment more than we think. So. It's important to remember there's no health without mental health, and that's why we do this. So first and foremost, we can lead by example. So what does that mean? It means actually starting to talk about our well-being. It means actually leaning in, using the pandemic as an excuse, if we need an excuse, to really start to talk about how we're doing. I think a lot of the challenges people have is they shut down and they don't even acknowledge how they're feeling. You know, you wake up in the morning and your body, your physical body is, is waving it, 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 its hand at you to say, oh, your leg hurts, your arm hurts. There's a pain, but are we ever really stopping and slowing down and reflecting? How am I actually doing today in this moment? Am I feeling overwhelmed? Am I feeling, am I not feeling the best? So it's really about leading by example um, and really talking openly about mental health. And then it's about heart-centered leadership, creating more compassionate interactions. So they, it's been said to build trust between yourself and your team or your leader is very important. It's, it's a bridge. You're, you're building a trusting rapport. God forbid something happens in their life. And then that, if that conversation can happen without there being fear or embarrassment. So it's really also about heart-centered leadership. And it's not... Um, assuming that everybody around you is okay. It's making sure that you're checking in with people and saying, are you really okay? How are you doing? Um, there could be people who are not checked on at all. And I say that over and over again, even the strong ones, you definitely wanna make sure that you are talking to people and notice things. So be courageous and don't step over the things that you, when you notice, if someone might be struggling, don't look away, like don't step over it. Actually notice if you, you're seeing something different in someone that you care about, a colleague, a peer, um, you know, a leader even, it takes something, it takes courage and it definitely will make a difference if you can, if you can interact with them and connect. It's also championing um, a better relationship to brain health within your culture. It's having it, having it be nothing more than brain health. We, we have this thing about mental illness that it's this, that it's this horrible thing and, but it's really just an organ. And I think if we can start relating and having people recognize that the brain is just another organ, let's start to change how people view mental illness just by referring to it as another organ. And this one I love, have your leaders go first. You know, a lot of our leaders, a lot of the people in our lives um, and the leaders that we work with, they've all gone through something. And if they haven't gone through something, a loved one of them has. And there's something very human about them sharing raw and authentically. It gives people permission. It creates an access. It creates an opening to have people feel less embarrassed. So I love this one because I've seen the most powerful leaders just be vulnerable and honest. And it does wonders for the environment and for how people relate to it. Because then people will talk about them telling their story. People will talk about them and their experience. And in that conversation, there's an opening for them too as well. And then consider creating grassroots efforts. This was one of the successes that I really did appreciate at my Fortune 50 company. We created an employee resource group. There are things like peer communities that can be created for mental health. But the thing is with these grassroots efforts, especially if you have an employee who 
has been out on disability, has struggled with something and has made the return to work or has navigated something successfully, they're little beacons of hope. They're the ones that you want everyone else to see. They've navigated it, they're back. They've navigated it, they never left. Whatever, whatever that looks like, they're your greatest uh, asset because they've been able to, to show that it's possible to navigate life and end a mental illness. So above all, if you see somebody that's hurting, don't look away. And if you're hurting, even though it might be hard, try to find the bravery within yourself to dig deep and go tell someone and take them up in your head with you. Very well said by Lady Gaga um, at the award ceremony. And I just want to leave you with that because it really does take something for us to lead by example, for us to have the courage to reflect on how we're doing and care for those around us. Um, cultivating that culture of compassion is a, is a group effort. So I have one tip, one additional tip, one little nugget that I wanted to make sure that I shared with you. And when we were talking in preparation for this conversation, I just wanted, I was thinking about what other value can I add? And it's definitely for you to explore this app called Clubhouse. And the reason I'm telling you this is it's a game changer. I've been on it for a month and it is an incredible platform of learning massive learning, massive network expansion, and um, just an amazing platform that is voice. And with voice, there's connection. Um, I've been in very deeply intimate rooms where there's a lot of open um, conversations. Um, but let me take a second to just sort of explain to you, if you've never heard of it, what actually Clubhouse is. So Clubhouse is considered the first ever audio-based social media app, and it's only available for iPhone. So if you have an Android, it's not yet available. Um, it's a new type of social product, and it's based, like I said, on voice, but it allows people to talk, to connect, to tell stories, to share concepts, to develop ideas, to deepen friendships, um, and it's global. Um, so there's people from all over the world who have wonderful nuggets of information to share, ideas, uh, resources. It's, it's a massive platform for learning. Uh, I've learned so much in the short amount of time I've been in there. I've gained a lot of connections and resources. And um, so it's wonderful. So I really just want to share that with you. It's invitation only, so you have to use your network to get in, but it's definitely something um, tying it back to mental health, there's a lot of people who are alone and they have, they have said that this voice, this voice app has really helped them feel connected. So whatever it takes, connection is everything. Um, I just wanted to like highlight that for you so that you knew it was um, available. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> yes. What when you said you have to use your network to get in? This yeah. is what, and uh, what what did you mean by that? Yeah, your friends. Call your friends. Say, hey, are you on Clubhouse? Get me an invitation. That's uh, literally what I mean. <laughs> but well, Jeremy's your friend, Michelle. Yeah, my, my new friend, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. So networking here. Yeah. Plus, um, so I just wanted to um, say, Michelle, when we spoke before, I was really taken by that information and tip you gave about the 17 seconds, because somehow I feel like I was told in cognitive therapy, think of all the things that could go wrong in your day and then prepare for that. So I kind of was in the habit of I'd wake up and I think, okay, what could go wrong? What do I need to anticipate? And then, you know, kind of get that in order. And you said, don't do that. Think, you know, kind of thoughts. And so I've really put that and it, it really has, I think, you know, kind of reset, you know, certain things. So I think that is a great tip and, you know, affirmations like you know said something that's not so difficult um you know it, like 
I plan to breathe deeply today or something that you know you can do if it, and it's, you know, will make you feel better. So thank you. I think uh, it, it's a beginning of good suggestions. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the key here is to be reflective of what you do on autopilot. You know, like before I learned about that, I was the one waking up in the morning, scrolling the news or scrolling social media or filling my head with all of the things that would make me worry instead of really starting off very empowered um, and in a space of gratitude, being present to what is working. So I think it's just about reflecting and going, what am I doing? What's the autopilot and is it serving me? So if, if you just did that alone and started to be mindful of it, you can already think about ways that you might want to make a difference, you know, change, change it up for yourself. Um, and what happens if you're in a company that is not enlightened? And in fact, they, if you have mental health or depression, they actually don't want to hear about it. And in fact, they may look at you as a liability. Are there strategies to somehow deal with that? I would say that's when you find your circle, whether it's your circle within your work or not, right? So if, you're, if your company culture is not there yet, so it's interesting because I've been reading a lot of really amazing articles on LinkedIn about this. And organizations, the ones, the organizations who are being acutely mindful about mental health and mental well-being, they're the ones that are going to attract the top talent. And they're the ones that um, the other companies that you're mentioning, talent is not going to necessarily stay. So what I would say is find your tribe, wherever that is. If your culture isn't supportive, then who are the people in your life that you can surround yourself with where you can get that connection um, until you feel like you're in a space to be like, okay, is this the right place for me to stay? Is this the culture I wanna be a part of? Um, but it's important to find, find those that you can connect with. And if it's not work, then find your, find your community. And I think one of the points that Leslie was making is in organizations like that, how do you, how do you really have an impact to make, make a difference and begin to accomplish change? So for us, when I was in my Fortune 50 company, the employee resource group sort of began organically. It was, it was a group of employees who were all touched by mental illness, whether it was a loved one or themselves who wanted to create a better culture. And that was grassroots. That was, you know, was, they sort of didn't ask for permission. They sort of just gathered and, and started to build. And then it started to catch a wave. People were like, they've created a resource group. Well, okay. And then leadership got on board. So it depends how influential you can be and how, how much you can rally people together to, to support one another. I have a question. Did you find that women versus men tend to gravitate to these support groups? You know, it's really interesting. I think traditionally men don't talk about their feelings, right? That more so, you know, women, we have no problem talking. But, you know, I think... I, I can't say that it was mostly women because when I think about some of the men that, you know, they were dealing with grief, they were dealing with, um, you know, they were dealing with grief, they were dealing with depression. There was a very outspoken gentleman with bipolar who just wanted people to know <clears throat> that he was, he was able to do life and succeed. So it was a, it was a bit of a blend, but you know, it, it tends to be that men don't talk. I mean, we know, we know this from the statistics of, of um, you know, mental health. Um, but I mean, it's creating that space for them to feel like they can, you know? Uh, it, it's inbred, right? Men are raised to be right. tough, to not, right. to not, yeah. I just interviewed an NFL football player about two hours ago. He was like, no way, we don't talk about that stuff. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, your mother? You know, clearly she was a big influence on you. Uh, how did your relationship with her impact your mental health? Yeah, you know, I was the one to think at first, well, I'm adopted, I'm not gonna be affected by this. But then, you know, you bring in the, the argument of nurture versus nature, right? 
so I had always dealt with seasonal depression. Um, and I just knew just get to a beach for a little bit in the winter and you'll be okay. You know, but the, um, the impact of my divorce really did, um, have me realize that like, you know, being around my mother's depression, feeling her sadness, feeling her despair and watching her cry, um, you know, all of that came back when I was diagnosed with depression. So it definitely shaped me, but it also taught me a lot of positives, right? Like it taught me empathy. It taught me, it taught me how to create sunshine on a rainy day. Like I, I got real good at that. So I think that that experience shaped me and, and, um, in a lot of ways is the driving force behind the work I do now. Um, because she did suffer a lot. And if I can alleviate the people in isolation and in shame, I want to do that. Yes, Julia. You're on mute, sweetie. Good. Oh, so professional. Um, I am. I really appreciated what you said about uh, workplace workplaces and how important it is for the leader to tell their story. Interestingly, I worked in several different PR agencies and my specialty was mental health drugs and my clients were pharmaceutical companies. So we may have crossed paths at some point. Um, and I, was, I had never thought about this before, how in one agency where, you know, we worked on a number of, um, CNS drugs um, and with all these great advocacy organizations, including Mental Health America, we never internally had any, it was like this removed thing um, in an environment that was otherwise extremely compassionate. Then when I moved to the, uh, to the next agency <clears throat> where the CEO talked, uh, you know, talked to the, you know, was quite open and had written about his mother's um, experience with bipolar disorder. Um, it did, it helped to, dis it went far in, I think, destigmatizing and helping even me people like me who was working in the area, just see it as a thing that was, could be closer and just was, However, we never got to the point, and this was in the 2000s, and maybe things have progressed, the idea of like, you know, having internal meetings about this wasn't quite there. But listening to you, I realized every place I've worked, women have played that role for me, and I have played that role for other women of creating an informal community which we never thought to go to leadership and say, hey, there's a need here because it was 1994, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, I really, you're, you're just right on and, and so important for, for leadership. But, so now my question. Yeah. Um, so I'm self-employed uh -huh. and I'm my own leader. I'm my own boss. I have to create my own structure okay. and leadership and have, you know, have confronted things in the last year yeah. that, you know, I thought I had it all handled, but now, you know, not being able to run out to Marshall's at two in the afternoon is destroying my life. And if I don't get to home goods, you know, by March, it's over. Yeah. I got it. I got it. You really need to just build your community, Julia. You really just need to know who, who is in your tribe. And I'm going to, I'm going to go back and, and point to Clubhouse, as, as silly as it might sound, there there are communities in that in that app where you can just talk to anyone at any at any time of day. <laughs> I'm in Clubhouse. Are you? I, I've been, I, I've been struggling over the last two weeks to understand how to fit more social media in my life. Yeah. Um, but no, everybody is saying. I, believe me, I got I I have so much support and so many people are urging me to do this. So maybe I think you're the, the tipping point and I'm actually going to make a commitment to yeah. make it work for me. Yeah, it's it's community. You know, mm -hmm. I, I you know, I'm in the same boat. I'm self-employed. I have my right. company. I've never done this before. And I felt like I was swimming without a net. So now on Clubhouse, I found a mastermind group. 
I found people who are doing the same thing I'm doing and I'm surrounding myself with them for connection, connection, support. Um, and that becomes mental health support, believe it or not. Right. Right. Oh, absolutely. We're absolutely. alone all day long. I look at my three dogs and I'm like, hello, you, you don't talk. So <laughs> that sense of community. Yeah. All right. Okay. I hadn't, believe it or not, I hadn't made that connection. <laughs> I'm going to look you up on, uh, on Clubhouse and connect. Oh, that would be great. I'm Julia 22 Walker. Awesome. <laughs> Michelle? Did, did your mom ever improve? Uh, you know, it was like, it was like in waves. Like she, she was on medication and then the medication would work and she'd start to feel better. She'd take herself off of the medication because she thought she didn't need it. And then she would crash. She improved as, as she got older. I think she stabilized. I wouldn't necessarily say improved. She stabilized to the point where she wasn't going back and forth to the hospital, being being hospitalized. Um, so I think I think she sort of got to a stable place. I, I have a question. I remember reading that um, Elon Musk uh, confessed to having uh, to be a, being a depressive, mm -hmm. and there's several other CEOs or or you know, uh, uh, business titans, for lack of another term, who have come out. And I, and I wonder, is it, do, do we need more senior leaders to, to be more transparent? Because ultimately, you know when someone has issues. It, it's, it, it doesn't have to be announced, but you know that there's something disturbing that person's mind processes. Yeah, and yeah. it trickles down. It, it becomes evident in that person's leadership style at some point or another. So I just wonder if there's if there's any kind of movement afoot to encourage CEOs by by setting examples that they will be helping so many thousands of employees by 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 stating what it is and yes. a safe environment. Yes, and look at someone like him telling his story. That's powerful. You know, that's powerful. I. I think, um, I don't know that there's a movement, maybe you're tipping me off to something, but, um, but I think it's important. I mean, I know for myself, uh, I've been trying to, so I have a mental health series called Michelle's Conversations That Matter, where I interview people. And I've been trying to grab some of the most successful entrepreneurs, like millionaires, people who have really hit it, to really sit them down and say, tell me about your mental health journey, because there's so many new people that, are, that can look up and learn from them. And um, yeah, people need to be hearing this from people that they look up to and, and then it becomes far less of a stigma. So I think you might be right. There might be some power with getting more leaders to talk about it. I have a comment on that. Um, I actually manage an actress in Hollywood who um, has, was, I met her through that previous job at the agency, blah, blah, blah. Um, Jennifer Lewis, she plays the grandmother on Blackish, and she has written and talked, spoken extensively about her experience with bi bipolar disorder. Wow. And um, so I've been working with her for 10 years. And during the last year, I've been gratified to see like an explosion of requests for her because <clears throat> there's so much activity um, especially in the african-american community right now around mental health it's like the cover has been ripped off yeah. the stigma that yeah. has been there for you know generations um uh it's and men um black men are talking about it. I think a lot of the conversation is rooted in the LGBT community, yes. uh, but has certainly been making its way into uh, just new circles, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, so that's, you know, if anything good, co good yes. comes out of this whole experience, it may be that people finally reached a point where they said, you know what, mm -hmm. I can, I can seek help. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's exactly why I had Reggie Walker on earlier today. He's an NFL, he's a former NFL football player, African American, and he just told his story about like the fact that like he, he had hit points where he just didn't want to be here, you know, right. 
And he had to sit with it. He had to sit and, and, and understand what was really, he had 27 years of like sexual abuse, all of this stuff that had compounded. And then he got, he gets fame of being an NFL football player. He gets success and all of this swirls around him. I can send you all the link for the interview. It was very powerful. And then yesterday I had uh, Justin Guarini, the former uh, runner up to the first American Idol on, and he's telling his story about how he almost jumped uh, he was not well. So we need those, those celebrities and those athletes. Those are the ones people look up to and they, they listen to, unfortunately, you know, like I'm just Michelle, but like, if I can get them and people can listen, then maybe they're, they're going to hear something in their story, which is what I'm hopeful for. Yeah. I have, um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I have um, some relatives that are deeply religious talking about the African-American slash Caribbean community where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's a, a couple of relatives that I know that suffer depression because of divorce and other things, but their only alternative is to go to church. They're very um, Catholic and go and pray. And I've been thinking of how do you find um, you know, maybe a, a Christian therapist or someone that um, they will respond to. Some of the churches are more sophisticated. Some churches have ministries where they have therapists on staff or whatever, but there are other churches where um, the only advice that they're giving a lot of people who's been through a lot of trauma yeah. is just come to church and pray. And they see, they still are not fully accepting a mental health. So you know, I think we also had to work with the clergy and some of these different groups in terms of how do you get um, help to, pe to people, you know, but yeah. still ingrain their spirituality and their practices. Right. Why does it have to be either or, you know, right, why right. can't it be both? Why can't I pray about it and then also mm -hmm. get additional support? It doesn't have right. But I think you're right. There's some work to be done there with, with leaders of, of those organizations. I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I can't see your name. Gabrielle. Um, Gabrielle. Gabrielle. <laughs> nice to meet you. You too. Uh, um, are you familiar with the bomb in Gilead? Yes, I am familiar with them. Okay. Because um, mm -hmm. I know I, I worked with them years ago, but... Um, they used to do I a lot of work around HIV AIDS. Yes, yes. Yeah, but they broadened... HIV AIDS, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. they have broadened... Mm -hmm. um quite a bit mm -hmm. and do but also i um many of the so you said your relatives are catholic i believe um i know that the african-american denominations mm -hmm. which don't which do and don't have you know footholds you know uh, globally um have resources mental yeah, health some, some of the churches are more sophisticated than, yeah. than others some of the larger churches like abyssinian and manhattan and some of these churches they have like um bereavement groups they have all kinds of groups but some of the smaller churches don't have that yeah right right mm -hmm. yes no i i understand that yeah mm -hmm. i think the key there is precisely what you two were were talking about is mm -hmm. It's finding the it's finding the people that your relatives admire and look up to, mm -hmm. and having them, they're the ones that need to say, you know, it's okay to talk to a therapist. Right, right. Um, but that is real. That's a real. Um, I know the frustration of of having people close to you that are really resistant to mm -hmm. new new places so yeah so it's a lot of you know it's a lot of work yeah. to do <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah gabrielle yeah I'm, I'm involved with an organization you might want to check out called crew cru dot mm -hmm. org okay and they have about twenty five thousand people worldwide mm -hmm. working with different programs to help people one of their main programs is called Family Life, mm -hmm. focusing on improving all aspects of family life. And mm -hmm. I'm the leader of the U.S. operation of family life. And I think mm -hmm. we would be very interested in hearing your thoughts and seeing if there were synergies between you. Okay, definitely. So, so just go on the website? Go on the website so you understand it and then reach out to me and okay. I'll make a connection. And your name is on um, 
Okay. I'm on LinkedIn and other places. Okay, great. I don't see your name. I don't. See Jack Killian, K I L L I O N. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see it now. <laughs> Dana, you're Thanks, muted. Jack. Hi, okay. I wanted to mention, I recently read a book called Maybe You Should Talk to Somebody by Lori Gottlieb, and it is excellent. I come from a difficult, a challenging family, and I've been a life, pretty much a, for my entire adult life, I've been seeing a therapist. And yet I learned so much from this book about the process of therapy and how it works and how the connection you make with the therapist is part of the healing. And I, I really recommend it to, to everybody. It's, it's so What's the good. name? It's called Maybe You Should Talk to Somebody oh, by Lori okay. Gottlieb. It's very unusual because she weaves her own therapy experience mm -hmm. in together with her experience treating patients whose identities she very carefully um, conceals. But she tells stories from her life as a therapist and her experience as a patient. And it, it's a very moving book, which I just could not put down. It was so interesting. Hmm. I'll check it out. And my Thank daughter, you. who is a therapist, also thought it was excellent. Michelle, I think you should give another mention of your book because I think your book is exceptional and I think mm -hmm. everybody would benefit from reading it. Why, thank you. It's, Tell us uh, about your book. Yeah, it's breaking, mm -hmm. it's called Breaking Into My Life. Uh, I can show it to you again. I, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a memoir. It, it took me four years to write. It was definitely not an easy process. Um, and it, it visually takes you through the experience of growing up with my mom um, here I can share my screen. Um, and you, you know, the whole idea behind me wanting to write this book was really, I wanted people to walk with me in that experience because, you know, for people who have had never ex been exposed to someone with a mental illness, you know, society gives us these these definitions of what someone who's mentally ill looks like, right? Unfortunately, through the media or whatever, I wanted people to recognize, you know, my, my story is very personal because like I cared for her when, when she was so sick that she couldn't be left alone. I stayed home from school. I cared for her. I saw her crying, you know, and there was nothing I could do to console her. You know, I saw her being taken away to Carrier Clinic, a, a mental institution here in New Jersey. Um, and, and so my goal with the book was really like, let me walk you through what, that's, what that experience was so you can get how hard it is for people with mental illness. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what I did. I, I, I take people on the journey with me from being a very little girl up to my young adult years, up to getting married. And then the you know, <laughs> the lingering effects of, of my mother on me in terms of the woman I've become, the habits that I constantly am working on. Um, you know, when you care for someone with a mental illness, it's very easy to get lost in the care of them and forget about yourself and uh, put everyone else's needs before your own. So that's been um, a constant unpacking for me and a lot of therapy to be able to, um, you know, put myself first, so. Were, you, were there other siblings in your household and also where was your father in the whole picture of this, of the, the dynamics there? Yeah, you know, I'll talk about my dad. My dad, um, he worked a lot. He worked for IBM. He was an engineer. And uh, I think that was like his, his escape. He really left my mother to, to do the, you know, caring for it at home. Um, but my father's knowledge of mental illness was very limited. You know, I mean, this is, we're talking the eighties and the eighties, mostly the eighties that I can recall. Um, you know, he would look at her and say, snap out of it. Anyone who knows someone with a mental illness can't snap out of it. It is what it is. Like I reflect on that. So 
he knew he did the best he could with what he knew and he still didn't know enough. Um, and I had two cousins that came to live with me. I, I talk about them in the book and, um, and yeah, it, it didn't make it any easier with them. Um, and my mom was just my mom. I mean, she was abusive. She was physically abusive, mentally abusive. Um, but then after she would go and go and have shock therapy and come home, she was like this brand new woman. And I was like, who are you? Um, and she was sweet and she was loving and she was everything I hoped for, but it was always like so, so short, short lived. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> It did. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Are you are you doing uh, therapies? Uh, obviously, most people are doing therapies on Zoom right now. But is, yeah. the, what is what's the sort of what is your how do you reach out to to people with your profession? And what's what's your what are your different <laughs> modules, so to speak. So I'm not a clinician, so I don't, I don't treat anyone, but I can talk from my own perspective. I have a therapist and he's all on Zoom. And so we have sessions on Zoom, you know, it is what it is. At least I have a session versus not, you know. Um, but, you know, the way I reach my, I'm reaching out to the clients that I work with is it's, everything is virtual and their employees, when I'm doing the resilience program, it's all virtual. So it's, uh, it's a different world we live in now. We will uh, put up more information about M Michelle's programs and her book um, on the China US Women's Foundation website. So um, we want it to be a resource. I can also see Julia that the whole topic of um, African Americans and mental health uh, especially after this, during this pandemic, it's probably something that we should consider either as a Zoom talk or as, you know, information, because I think that's one of the things with Black Lives Matter that, you know, all of the legacy of slavery and discrimination has really wreaked havoc and it's just now starting to be talked about, you know. Um, so and then how about being in a team at work where, it got talked about in June and never mentioned again. And now what does that feel like? You know? Yeah, it's, pre it's, re it's pretty deep. But am I muted? Yeah, no. 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 Um, <laughs> but yeah, you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big, yeah. Anyway, it's big, big to me, I, big topic yeah. because I, I know how important it is. Yeah. Any other comments, uh, suggestions? No, I, I just yeah. want to say thank you for this very interesting and meaningful talk. And I made a note of the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you, you are welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for allowing me to share with you and be a contribution. Oh, thank you. Thanks for your advice. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Looking yeah, thanks, to Michelle. Thanks everyone. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Michelle. Um, and uh, really, um, I'll send a survey to everyone who participated. If you have ideas for future Zoom sessions or would like to share insights, please be in touch. Um, I'm Leslie at CUSWF.org. Um, we are a community. We honor everyone who participates and we look forward to um, being together and supporting each other. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.